May the words of my mouth so awaken the spirit within us that we may fully appreciate the universal rule of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. From this morning's collect on this Christ the King Sunday is the phrase mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth divided and enslaved by sin may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule. Was Jesus a king? We read the gospel this morning, and, and does, I don't know if anybody else sort of feels, what's this gospel doing here? That's more for the Passion Week and the end of Lent, and just before Easter, when Jesus is confronted with Pilate. And yet this is Christ the King Sunday that ends up at the very end of our church year. Now that's, that's sort of so what, you know? Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent and we prepare for what? Christmas, the birth of Christ. Okay, if you figured this all out, why we have this Sunday a part of the Passion, next Sunday the beginning of the preparation for the birth of Christ, um, if you figured that out, you're welcome to come up here and I'd be happy to sit down and listen because I'm still struggling with it. But as I prepared today for today, and yes, I have to admit, when I was asked what Sunday I would preach, I said, oh, Christ the King, that should be easy. I'll preach that Sunday. So here I am. So I open the book and I look at this and I say, wait a minute. I have this recollection, this vivid recollection, back when I was in training in seminary from that Old Testament piece that said in 1 Samuel. You know, remember Samuel was confronted with his, his people, the Israelites, they wanted a king because they didn't have one. Nobody had that label of king. They'd had their leaders and people who did well by them. But they felt to be a nation, they needed a king. So the Samuel went to the Lord and said, what do I do? And what did the Lord tell Samuel? Well, he said, go back and tell the people, be careful what you ask for. And this is what the Lord said to Samuel. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, of, commanders of fifties and some, plow, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. So here we have the Lord, God himself telling us, be careful what you ask for. Now we fast forward close to 3,000 years and we wanna call Jesus Christ the King king by this definition? I don't think so. Not for me. Let's look at a little bit further forward in, in scripture to David, the anointed king, the one that was chosen by God himself. Yes, 
beloved, yes, a wonderful king, except too human, succumbed to his humanness and gave us another example how that we can abuse power. And yet, to do good. And we'll leave out some kings in between and let's fast forward now to Jesus. Did Jesus come as a king? I think not. Born in a manger? Amongst the animals? Baptized in the Jordan River? The man who wandered about with not legions, but 12 disciples, apostles. Uh, yes, there were some followers, but certainly didn't have thousands following him along with chariots. And as John the Baptist would bring to his attention while poor John was in prison, Matthew tells us in his gospel, he sends out the message to Jesus are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? John himself, Jesus' cousin, just didn't understand the role of the Messiah. Most likely expected Jesus, by that time in his life, to have taken on royal robes, to have legions behind him, to have conquered Rome and the kings, and to have established Israel as a nation. Jesus finishes up his ministry, rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and certainly praised, but the next thing you know, we are confronted with that gospel that we had today, where the issue of Jesus as king is raised by human beings. Pilate asks Jesus, are you king of the Jews? And I say, was he king of the Jews? Certainly they, the, the hard and fast rulers, the, the uh, priests and the those who were in decision-making positions for the Jews did not accept Jesus as king. As a matter of fact, Pilate turns to, in a, in a subsequent portion of the, this gospel, turns to the chief priests and says, shall I crucify your king? And what do they say? They have no other king but the emperor. So obviously, they did not consider Jesus their king. And then the insult of them all for us, this sign that may have been posted on Jesus' cross that said, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. And his crown of thorns. Now we are at today because we are acknowledging and worshiping Christ the King. What is that in a current context? What does that say to us? Well, for me, I had to rethink my concept of King and put it into terms that I could come to grips with given history of what man has done to abuse power. Because when I think of kings, for the most part, I think of men, yes, but I also think of royalty and queens from history who have abused their position of power over humankind. So, for us today, is Jesus king of the Jews? Is he king of the Christians? Is he our king? King of the universe. What does that mean? 
we must rethink the role of a king and adapt and view kingship through the model that Jesus laid out for us. That being a reign that Pope Pius, in 1925, when the churches established this Sunday as Christ the King, Pope Pius suggested that we view Christ's reign as being reigning over our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and our souls. Looks a little different, doesn't it? If we look back at the ministry of Jesus that we have been for the last, how long is Pentecost uh, and the Sundays following? It's 20 some. So we're, we're quite a ways into that. What have we been doing but we've been reflecting on Jesus' ministry amongst his people and what he reigned over while he walked on this earth. What he attempted to do was to enter the minds, the souls, the hearts and to establish a different relationship that we have with Christ in us, in our bodies, over what we do with our bodies, how we serve. So my suggestion, my, what do I leave behind this Sunday? Is interrupted very briefly by a reminder and this happened, I, I don't believe I've ever seen this before, but there was an ad on television this morning as I tried to pick up some news uh, for a, a new series on television that my wife reminded me was not so new called God Befriended Me. Has anybody seen that? Or maybe you've seen reference to it. Um, what it made me think about is my relationship with God. Here we are, we're preaching about God's reign over us, and at the same time, I realized my relationship with God, with God today is defined with one word, love, but it's a friendship. It's not a powerful dominion. It's a, it's a relationship that's built on respect, yes, but not fear but love and compassion. So, the reign of Jesus Christ suggests that we acknowledge that he reigns over our minds, our wills, our hearts, our body and soul. His power is all about our willingness to be his subjects, in the exercise of love, compassion, and justice in everything that we do, feel, and understand. He calls us, as his subjects, to believe, to love, and to serve. His kingdom has come. His will is being done right here on earth and in heaven. Amen.